Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Tonight, explore the perfect ways to enjoy the fall season across the state. Discover incredible vistas and towering vantage points to take in the seasonal colors. Travel to Nashville, Indiana to see an artisan transform wood into a work of art. Delight in the harvest of fresh apple cider and brandy with Earth Eats. And prepare for the cool nights with fiber artists as they weave life into old traditions. It's all coming up tonight on the weekly special celebration of Autumn in Indiana. Hello and welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. For many Hoosiers, their favorite season is upon us, fall. The colors are turning, the weather is brisk, and it's the perfect time to get out of your house and into nature. We'll start with a favorite. The sound of these visitors seems to herald in the season. And why not? They're probably the first to notice the changing trees. Cranes are large birds. Uh, they stand three to four feet tall, have a wingspan of six to seven feet and they have the habit, at least in the non-breeding season, to gather together in large numbers. And anytime you get this many birds in one place, you're going to draw a crowd. That's certainly the case here at the Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area near Madariaville. Throughout most of the year, the visitors to these 8,000 acres are hunters, but for decades, every fall, and to a lesser degree in the spring, it's bird watchers drawn to northwest Indiana by thousands of migrating cranes. So if you were to put a dot in central Wisconsin, which is the core nesting area, and a dot in central Florida, which is the core wintering area, lo and behold, guess who's right underneath that line if you drew a straight line? Jasper Pulaski. So the, the cranes learn to use this area, and today they use it in large numbers, probably more than they would have in the 1800s and the early 1900s. During the day, they fly out to the surrounding private land and they feed in agricultural fields that have been harvested. And then uh, in the late afternoon uh, to sunset, even sometimes after sunset, they'll return to the fish and wildlife area. And a behavior that this population has developed is that a large percentage stop in the field called goose pasture before they fly into the wetlands to roost at night. That's just a unique feature of this particular population of cranes, which makes great viewing opportunities. To give guests a better idea of how great the opportunity will be, Jim and his crew do a count every Tuesday this time of year. As of last week, there were nearly 10,000 birds flocking to goose pasture each night. Historically, the cranes tended to peak in mid-October. That peak is now late November to early December. We've had peak counts as high as 35,000. Probably the more average is 12 to 16,000, sometimes the low 20,000s. The numbers are striking especially when you consider that the cranes seen at Jasper Pulaski today were nearly wiped out in the early 1900s. Sandhill crane populations reached their lowest numbers in the 30s and the 40s. Some of the estimates are only 300 pairs in this particular population existed in the 1930s. And so its habitat was protected in the breeding areas, which are just north of Indiana, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and a little bit into southern Canada. 
uh, the population began to increase. And that happened to coincide with the development of this area beginning in the 1930s. What we did for waterfowl management, ducks and geese, benefited cranes and the position of Jasper Plasky, the cranes used the area and then continued to use it. So if you like to come see the cranes, Jim has a few tips. Well, check the weather, you know, dress appropriately. If you have binoculars, bring them. The viewing platform does have outdoor spotting scopes. Considering they're outdoors, they're pretty good, but they're limited. So if you have other optical equipment, that would be great to bring. A lot of people envision that you're going to almost be able to walk amongst the cranes. But you have to remember that these are wild critters. And in most cases, with any wild critter, you can't approach very closely. Now, based on the nature of this viewing area, they become quite accustomed to the people in the viewing area. So as long as people stay within the boundaries of the viewing area, oftentimes the, the view is quite close. For the latest information on the Sandhill Crane fall migration and how you could witness the birds in your area, visit in.gov. But well, one of my favorite ways to experience the fall colors is high atop one of Indiana's historical fire towers. And Hickory Ridge in Brown County is one of the best places around. Now, this tower is 110 feet tall, so that's roughly 11 stories. When you get to the top, you're above the tree line, and it's absolutely beautiful. But it's not just pretty views that this tower offers. There's also a lot of history behind it. So this tower here was built in 1939, and dozens were built in Indiana. What was the point of these towers? Well, in the 1930s, there were a few towers built before that, but in the 1930s, they realized that we were losing our topsoil and we weren't going to be able to get our forests back unless they stopped all the fires that were starting every spring and fall. Okay. And so they started building these lookouts in order for them to be able to spot the fires early and be able to mobilize the firefighters and put them out. Okay, wonderful. And how long were they in use for? until the 70s, although we're still using them some today. This one? This one is still used today. I run up with my cell phone high fire wow. danger days just to look around. It, you know, they'll think they see the smoke. Do I have any idea where it was? And I can run up and look. So tell me how this tower has changed since it was first in use in the 40s. The CCC built it, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And at that time it was built, there were 84 different farms here. It wasn't a wilderness at that time. Oh, wow. It was definitely just rural farmland. So the view has totally changed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, what you see now just looks like remote wilderness in all directions. But okay. in those days, it would have looked like just rural countryside. So it's very different. And this was not the only tower in the Hoosier National Forest. No, at that time we had nine. But then they, they started using aerial surveillance. And unfortunately, they tore down eight of the Forest Service towers, and this is the only one left. And they left this one because it's in the wilderness area. A lot of people come and visit, and so it's just kind of a destination point for recreation people. Well, I think it's time for me to climb the tower. How many steps do you think I've got to the top there? I think it's 123, so <laughs> but it's worth the I view. can do it. I can do it. Well, thanks so much for meeting us out here and shedding some light thanks. on this very cool tower. Appreciate it. Okay. We're here in the cab of the fire tower. It's the room at the tippy tippy top. It's pretty tight quarters up here, about seven feet by seven feet, and it's where lookout men like Dennis Gowen used to work. So Dennis, the fire tower that you worked at in Morgan Monroe Forest reopened uh, recently, and, and you love that idea, right, of the fire towers being open again. Why is that? It's part of history, and, and a lot of these young children, they don't know what a fire tower is. And so I have a dream that all the fire towers in the state of Indiana are rebuilt and open to the public so that the public can see actually what the history of the fire service and how these towers actually protected the forest. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for climbing up the Hickory Ridge Fire Tower and talking with us today. And you've given us a lot to think about next time we climb up and take a look at this gorgeous view. To find a map of fire towers in your area or for hours and directions to Hickory Ridge, visit fs.usda.gov. Well, Brown County doesn't just offer incredible views. It's also known as a haven for Hoosier craftsmen and artists alike. And if you've been to Nashville, you've probably seen our next subject, Busy at Work. I really thought when I was coming out of high school, I was gonna go, go into science. Art was like the last thing that I thought I would do. As you start life and things aren't exactly how you think they're gonna be, you kind of find your way one way or another and this must be what I was meant to do.
I just think it's probably like in our blood, a lot of the art, you know, so it just kind of uh, finds you eventually. My great, great, great grandfather was a famous sculptor at Notre Dame. The woodworking came from just being a carpenter, you know, I, having extra pieces of wood at night and I would just take it and kind of mess with it in the garage. Something just told me I needed to do this, you know, and I'm just pretty stubborn. Once you set your wheels to go do something, you know, you just gotta go do it. And I just haven't looked back since then. Using tools, you kind of get a, a sense of how things push and pull. And that's one of the main things, you know, you gotta know how the, the chainsaw turns and everything. And when it's all about the different pressures and stuff. And if you push too hard, then it's jumping on you. And if you don't push hard enough, then it ain't cutting. It's definitely practice, and you have to do it almost every day because as soon as you back off and take off a few days, then you regress. Once I started using it, it just became a part of me, you know? Most carvers do draw something on the piece, but I don't. I just kind of just get a kind of a picture of what I'm working with and just kind of start. A big part of it is, is when you're a carpenter and you're cutting these pieces of wood and stuff, you develop a, a picture in your head of what's going on. You know, it's like you can visualize yourself in the room and where these pieces gotta go. So you're, you're actually just looking in your head. So if you use it all day long, every day for 15 years, then you can just kind of look in there and, and be able to see, you know, it's kind of a vision. I usually start on the top and, and kind of work my way down from there, but um, just kind of blocking out areas. But now I can already see right to where I need to go. And each time it gets a little bit closer. Each year, like I have more confidence going a little bit closer without getting out of proportion. I like doing the big things and I like to do go off on a tangent and do what I want to do as an artist. Like I always knew I wanted to do a full-size horse. It was just a matter of waiting for that piece of wood, you know, and as soon as I got it, I was like, all right, there's the horse. I always try to push myself, so everywhere I look, I'm seeing and getting little flashbacks of things I see, and some things just stick out to me, you know, and I remember them. To see the progress of what you can make in one day. With this kind of stuff, it happens fast, so you feel like you, you did something that day and you can take credit for it yourself, so. It's awesome, you know? I think it's pretty cool, definitely. It makes me feel like, you know, what I've done is fulfilling. It makes me realize that this is what I want to do, you know, for the rest of my life, and that I'll enjoy it. To see the latest examples of Chris's work and information on how you can visit his shop, go to his website, woodcarvernashvillein.com. For me, it's not quite fall until I've had a mug of fresh, warm apple cider, especially when award-winning cider is right down the road at Musgrave Orchards. My name's Andy Hamilton, and I am the owner-operator of Musgrave Orchard. This is a 80-year-old apple orchard. I actually bought the orchard from the Musgrave family 10 years ago. When we first bought the orchard, it was conventionally grown, and we were able to transition towards organic production, which was our goal. We only have 300 trees. Sounds like a lot, but production orchards have anywhere between six and 8,000 apple trees, and it could have anywhere from 10 to 20 varieties of apples. We're somewhat limited. We're dependent on local orchards in the area to get the varieties of apples that people want and the right mix of apples that we want for our apple cider. But regardless, apple cider that's fresh from the farm, uh, you can't beat it. We try to leave the cider house open so people can come out and take a look at it and get an experience of what this machine looks like and what makes uh, Indiana's finest apple cider. And it has for uh, 87 years. So nowadays they have these newer 
cider mills that are compact where we have this dinosaur and from one end to the other it's about 30 feet long and it's got different components to it that uh, make up the entire cider press. We'll harvest our fruit and we'll put them in these big 18 bushel wooden bins which can weigh a thousand pounds. The apples as you open this gate roll out onto this stainless steel table here where they get rinsed any debris gets sprayed off of them and then they land in this wooden hopper and it carries the apples up so it grinds them up makes applesauce and it falls down through this chute right here and so you build it 10 high and that pedestal press pushes all those cloths up against this butcher block here. And it takes about a half hour for it to completely press all the juice out. And so if you can imagine that stack of apples being about three and a half feet tall, when it's all done and pressed, it's about a foot tall. So it squeezes almost every drop of juice out of the apples. We make uh, apple cider and we win awards for it. It's just something neat to put in your orchard to say, hey, we make really good cider. For more information on Musgrave Orchard, including hours and directions, visit corefarmscsa.com. Apple harvests have been a part of Hoosier life for centuries, and for historic Huber Winery, their apple harvests have led not only to a family tradition, but a family legacy. We're here at Huber's Orchard, Winery, and Vineyard. It's also the home to Starlight Distillery, which makes Indiana's only apple brandy. Today, we're gonna find out what exactly apple brandy is and how it's made. Let's go. We're here in the orchard with Dana, who is part of the Huber family. And Dana, this is a really exciting time at Huber's. Tell us all that's going on. It is, it's a great time of year. It's one of our favorite seasons. We have apple picking, pick your own pumpkins, caramel apples, spiced apple wine. And certainly that's what we're traditionally known for, both our farming and our winery here in Southern Indiana. But not many people know all the great things we have to do here. Yes, it was like a fall wonderland when we drove in here. <laughs> and uh, people probably know Huber's for its wine. You guys make wonderful wine. But today we're here to talk about apple brandy, which is something that the Huber family has been distilling since 1840 when they settled on this very land that we're standing on right now. And all the apples in the apple brandy come from the Huber's Orchard. And so what can you tell us about the orchard? I can tell you it is all about tradition. These uh, two 80 acre tracks were originally settled by our ancestors. And of course they were growing apples. And so we proudly carry on that heritage by producing our apple brandy. We have about 15 different varieties of apples. Okay. And depending on the ones that are selected by our master distillers, will tell us what we'll have in our apple brandy. Okay, wonderful. And right now we're gonna head into the distillery and we're gonna see exactly how apple brandy's made. We're here with Jason, who is a distiller at Hewers. And Jason, I'm so curious how those apples that we saw in the orchard end up uh, as apple brandy. So can you take us through the process a little bit? Sure, the uh, apples are pressed in the cider press. Uh, the juice is fermented into apple wine, and then we pump the apple wine into the all still here. All right, so this is the still. This, this is, is a magnificent piece of equipment. Uh, tell us what it does. Well, as we heat the wine up, alcohol has a lower boiling point than water, so we can boil off the alcohol. As the vapors rise up the column, water comes in to condense the vapors back into liquid form, which will then come out of the condenser here and out into this tank. At that point, it's clear apple brandy that's about 160 proof. And that's too high of proof to drink, right? Yes, uh, okay. well, I mean, comfortably. <laughs> uh, we will dilute that going into the barrel to about 115 to 120 proof, and then it will age for about five to seven years before wow. we will be ready to bottle it. So what's going on in here is gonna take some time before we, we get yes. to sample it. <laughs> and earlier you mentioned that what's in here is wine. So are you saying that it actually starts out as apple wine? Yes, any distillation, what creates the alcohol is fermentation. So you have to add yeast or allow the juice to ferment into wine. And then all the distillation is, is removing the alcohol from the fermented wine. Okay, 
That's something I didn't know about Brandy. And here we have Brandy coming out right now. All right, look at that. Here is some diluted apple brandy that we distilled earlier, and you notice it's still clear. Yes, okay, but this is lower proof. Lower proof, okay. it's about 85 proof. I diluted it down. Uh, is there anything, any tasting notes I should be looking for well, here? You should uh, get a little fresh apple. Mm -hmm, uh, I do. You'll obviously get uh, the flavor of the apple, and uh, it may be a little bit young and harsh at this point, but. Uh, no, but you can still, this is not water. Yeah, Ooh. not, not water. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, you can, it's not overly apple -y. It's not like drinking apple cider or right. apple wine, but you do get a hint of sort of that crisp apple flavor. It's yes. really nice. And I'll get you a sample of something that's uh, a little bit older. All right. Right out of the barrel. Look at this. How long has this been aging? Uh, this is three years old. And you said normally four to seven, so almost there. Almost there. A couple more years All at right. least. And so you then, can really uh, see the difference in color, and again, the color in this one is coming from the char inside the barrel. From the barrel, yeah. Okay. This is a heavy toast barrel. So All right, uh, and anything I should be uh, looking for in this one? You'll notice a lot more uh, wood notes yes. and uh, a caramelization of the of the sugars in the uh, wood gives the color and some flavor and aroma as wow. well. It's already really smooth, even though it has some time to go. And that's still about 115 proof. Okay, so we can't have too much of this. Right, right. <laughs> well, Jason, thank you so much for showing us how those beautiful apples from the orchard become apple brandy. I found it really fascinating, and I'm going to head up to the tasting room now to sample an apple brandy that's fully aged. Well, we've had a great time here at Huber's, and who knew that you could take these beautiful apples from the orchard and turn it into something delicious to drink, like apple brandy. For the latest listing of events and products, visit their website, huberwinery.com. If a smooth sip of apple brandy isn't warm enough on a cool fall evening, there are incredible artists across the state transforming winter coats into winter blankets. There's a rhythm to spinning. There is a rhythm to needlework. If you listen to, to knitting, you hear that clack, clack. It's a musical kind of thing. And when I'm weaving, once I get started, something that happens that takes over. And I think it's, um, for want of a better word, the, the gods blessing us with we're doing good work. I have an ancestress who spun and wove in Scotland in the mid 1700s. Interestingly enough, between her and I, nobody spun and wove. She saved her gifts a couple of hundred years to hand them down to me. And I feel very blessed because when I began my weaving, once I got the rhythm, I, I was fine. Like second nature, it's like I'm supposed to be doing this. The walk-in got started because of a way to actually process loosely woven cloth into a more cohesive blanket-like structure. If you would take just a piece of cloth and just stand in one place and pound it, that place would become pounded. The rest of it would just become loose. It would not become cohesive. So what they do, they grab a piece and it's pound and pass, pound and pass. In Scotland, several people would bring their, their lengths of cloth to be fulled or walked, and uh, it would become like a quilting bee. It was done here. Somebody put on a pot of beans, somebody brings some, some oatmeal or something, and it would become an event. It becomes not an assembly line, but a constant movement. It's not meditative as much as it is a sense of community, a sense of, of all being together. The laughter that happens when we're all doing the same thing. It was wonderful. Producing your own wool is a, is a tremendous thing. It's so wonderful to be able to think, okay, this sweater came from Annie, this sweater came from Maven. It's important we understand where things, our clothing comes from because nobody knows anymore. We don't buy from the neighbor down the road. We don't buy from grandmother on the corner who produces sweaters. I think people today have lost tactile. I don't think we understand the different textures. I don't think we understand getting wet and having fun, you know, other than in a swimming pool. In our world today, it's all plastic and acrylic and fake. And working with wet wool is a real thing. We can't change the whole world, and I have no intention to do it, but I'm trying to save my cottage, my world, my industry, because it's important. If we lose our background, we lose it all. The more technologically advanced our society becomes, 
there's always going to be this nucleus who needs to connect and who needs to have some tactile something about what's really happening in America and what's really happening here and the fact that okay I drove down the road to the local farm and I bought this yarn and now I'm making this sweater or whatever I just think that's pretty cool well we've added a few people to the set here I wanted to introduce some superstars that we have had behind the scenes today these are the kids from Wonder Camp and you guys have done an amazing job thank you for all of your help well, that is all the time that we have for tonight. So thanks, thanks for, for watching the weekly, weekly special. special. Good night. Don't cry, guy on vacation. Leave here on probation. Oh, God, the door, it's the only game in town. You can't live here like Tom Sawyer. Bring your checkbook and your lawyer when you come to visit here in the hills of Brown. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.